Hello, I'm Dahi O'Kiran, and you're listening to Poetic Synergy, a programme that explores Eastern influences on the work of some Irish poets. Later on, I'll be meeting with a group of panellists who will explore those Eastern influences on this poet's work. Today, I'm in the company of Paddy Bush. Paddy, you're very welcome to the programme. Thank you, Dahi. Could you tell us about your own personal journey that led you to embracing Eastern influences on your work as a poet? I suppose... It wasn't uh, a conscious thing. I realised a long time afterwards when I, when I remembered that I had read a fair lot of Chinese poetry when I was a teenager. I remember getting books out of the library. I had the Penguin Anthology of Chinese Verse. And uh, all of that really had faded into the background. I hadn't read it for years. And then in 1999, my son was teaching English in Korea for a year and myself and my wife decided to go and visit him. It was really an excuse to travel. We went to Korea for two weeks. We stayed in China for two weeks and suddenly all of this stuff came back to me. And I think it was, as a lot of my poetry is, a, a response to landscape, which I recognised from what I had been reading, you know, some 30 or more years before. What was the experience like of looking at the landscape uh, compared to the imaginations of the teenage boy back home in Ireland? Did it live up to your expectations? It far exceeded them. Um, You know, I think we've all absorbed a a cultural landscape of China in a way, you know, the the Chinese painting and so forth. So it, it was like walking into a pictorial landscape, a cultural landscape, which had been in, imagined before, and there it was real with, you know, with real people with bicycles and uh, the odd car. I found it wonderfully exhilarating and imaginatively very liberating and enabling. All of this happened in a, without my realising it until mm-hmm. it had happened. So it came to you unconsciously, and I noticed in your description of the landscape in China, you said this magnificent landscape swept before you. And I know mm. that you live in Kerry, and that you have mm-hmm. a view of Skellig Michal. I was entranced by the steps on Skellig Michael, and I know that Chinese monks have a habit of sweeping up steps. I was just wondering, was there some sort of connection there for you? Um, yeah, well, there, there I mean... Uh, Everywhere I go, I can be reminded of Schellig. I, you know, distinctly remember walking in Nepal um, about 18 months ago and part of the walk that had stone steps on it. It was close to a village and they, there was a particular curve as it went up a steep part of the mountain. And, you know, for a few seconds, I thought I was in Schellig. And then, of course, in, in the high places in the east, Uh, particularly in Nepal, very often there is a monastic presence with um, the kind of life, you know, in a a 21st century setting, but the the kind of life that was very common in Irish monastic things in the early Christian period uh, there in contemporary terms. So those things echo against each other. You know, the two come together in a, a... Synergy. To me, la- landscape gives rise to almost every poem I write. Okay. You know, that, that may be a political poem, it may be um, a love poem, uh, it may be purely a descriptive poem, but uh, almost every poem I've ever written I can identify with a particular place. Uh, w- one of the things I suppose that You know, you you learn to look at the politics, to read the newspapers, you know, I mean, there are always English language newspapers, you know, be it in in China or whatever. And to see the the concerns of the people who live there and uh, to observe the politics of the place, and I mean politics in in the broadest sense, uh, in a critical way to go behind uh, the cliché. And I think that's important. But I mean, it, it's important in our own lives at home as well. And that's something that struck me from reading through your poems, is that there's an anti-establishment sort of rebel aspect to your writing. And is that something you would say that you've brought as an Irish person 
to China and Nepal and the Himalayas are... No, no, I, I absolutely would not make any large claim like that. I wouldn't even think of myself as particularly mm-hmm. rebellious or anti-establishment. Um, you know, I'd be mildly left wing. No, I, I just think that would be too big a claim for me. I would okay. I would shy away from it. All right. Well, maybe the panel might mm. see some of that in your poems. We'll see in a while. Um, I'm going to ask you about one particular Chinese poet that you wrote about. Mm-hmm. And um, his name is Lai Bai. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us about Lai Bai, how he's influenced you and wh- what way you perceive him as a poet? A poet of the Tang dynasty lived in the 8th century. He was a rebel nonconformist an intensely lyrical poet, an intensely lonely poet at times. And he was somebody who spent a lot of time in exile uh, outside the political establishment. The normal thing in the, in, at that time was that uh, poets took governmental exams and got a civil service job uh, because poetry was and still is high, highly regarded in Chinese culture. Uh, Li Bai never went the civil service route. He's somebody uh, who's, the, as I mentioned loneliness and exile. The moon is enormously important in Li Bai. He has an extraordinary lyrical intensity. Uh, he writes enormously of loneliness uh, but in such a vivid way that it's it's strangely consolatory, the way he writes. Uh, he also writes a huge amount about wine uh, and he makes jokes of it. I, I think it's a kind of black humour. He talks about he's, ra- uh, he's having a toast and uh, there's only the moon and his shadow and he raises his glass or cup as he says and the shadow raises the cup and there's the moon and he's really he writes about it as, as a kind of drunken joke but to me it's, it's a poem about loneliness uh, I wrote a poem Levi's last poem where I imagined he was writing you know before this happened and I imagined his intense loneliness his disillusionment you know I find it hard to believe now but it was actually about a year after I wrote that poem um, that I realised I was writing about myself because I had my own encounters with alcohol, uh, which were by no means all positive. At the time I wrote it, I hadn't given up drinking. I have now. And, you know, a lot has clarified for me since. So it was a form of clarification. I found another time I was very, I felt very lonely. I was by myself in China and I wrote again the po- a poem called The Poet Pines in Exile in Suzhou. And it mentioned Li Bai doing the same sort of thing. So he's had a huge um, influence on me. So Li Bai, I suppose, of all the Eastern poets has been uh, an enormous influence on me. Is it like that your sensitivity to the universe and the universal and to the loneliness within you, would you say that is, that is something that was a surprise to you as a result of... Um, I would say, going to China and exploring Lai Bai and his poetry and his life and then poetically exploring it. Well, yeah, I mean, I suppose it clarified things for me. It it gave me something in another culture to which I could relate. And when it's in another culture, you can also stand back from something. You can do it at a distance and uh, you don't have to say, I think this or this happened to me. You can use the factual parts of somebody else's life and project other things onto it. How has that evolved since in terms of your expressiveness as a poet uh, as a result of, you know, moon gazing beautifully and Silver River? Eastern poetry, Chinese poetry in particular, wears its heart on its sleeve. I suppose reacquainting myself with all that freed me in a way to write in a way which I would have hesitated to do before. Now, maybe I I still use an Eastern tool to do that. I mean, my most recent book is called My Lord Buddha of Karigena. Now, Karigena is out in the sea, just out from my house. Uh, The Buddha is a plaster cast Buddha that I bought in a garden centre in Carsevine, 10 miles away. But by using this... 
uh, by using the Buddha as a speaker, I suppose I say things that I mightn't say if I were writing directly myself. I, at least I think that's what I'm doing, but maybe the panel who come after me might be able to analyse that better than I can. So there was a freeing up of your expressiveness and your directness. I think so. Yeah. But, you know, I'd leave it to others to judge yeah. that. But I, I, I feel there was, yeah. It certainly, I wrote more freely the first time I went to the East, particularly to China. Uh, you know, writing came out in 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 a flood for me after that. I mean, I, I wrote a, a whole book of called The Nitpicking of Cranes that had to do with um, travelling in the East. And... Is it that you found your own heart there? No, I, I, w I would think of that as too big a statement. I found an aspect of myself there, or maybe not found it, but um, something freed it. You, you talked about the hermit and, you know, the looking at the universal mm -hmm. earlier on, and there's an entrancement about the way that you write poetry, and there's also a femininity to the way that you write poetry. Would you say that that got stimulated uh, through the writing that you did after your experience in China or was it something that existed before? No, I, I think it existed before. I mean, I, I suppose, you know, go, going to China and Nepal places um, east, maybe they were the whole key, but, you know, maybe it was a development within myself as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think as, as we get older, uh, if we develop properly, which I hope I'm doing, the more inhibitions you can learn to lose, mm -hmm. I, I think the the um, well, the more aspects of yourself you can express in writing, and the the more aspects of the world you can you can express in writing, and and maybe as a younger person, I was too tight arsed to do that. <laughs> That's a wonderful thing to be able to celebrate is this freeing up and actually being able to... Mm. You talked about sweeping and curving earlier on. So maybe mm. the feminine aspect of, of you as a poet became free in the process of, you say, engaging and exploring the stimulus that you... I, I would hope so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I was wondering, Paddy, um, would you mind reading one of your poems for us? Sure. The Long Dance of Thulo Shibru. Hoard this... The sheen of starlight on mountains, as it was and as it will be here at the present time. The name of the village also hoard it, seeing that the long dance is how it translates. And look, see the long procession of summits, step after step linked in snowy stateliness. The reel of stars knocking frosty sparks from the huge floor of the sky above, and her own ring whirling around the moon as terraced fields step out under her light. Hoard all this for yourself, and hoard also the memory of the wedding that welcomed you into its own long celebratory dance when you chanced by these parts for the first time last year, and hoard the memory of the young couple anointed with butter for prosperity all through the day. Hoard this, and hoard the monks chanting this afternoon sutras for the quiescence of the soul of the newly dead, while in the porch the young lama proudly traced the wheel of life that flowered by the monastery door, traced especially those hells whose blacknesses in our own deceiving we conjure from the light. Hoard my treasured self, the dawn of each present day on the darkness you made of the light within yourself. Hoard your own brightness for the rest of the days of your life and the long dance unbroken to the very borders of time. Thank you so much, Paddy. And thank You're you so much for anointing us in butter. I really <laughs> love that. Thank so, you, Dan. To celebrate the connective synergy in Paddy's work, I'm joined by Peter Denman from the Department of English in NUI Minute and the poet and member of Estana, Kahal O'Sharkig. You're all very welcome to the programme. Or Guru Mayogod, I should say. <laughs> I was wondering, 
could we begin a discussion where we could celebrate the connectivity that we've seen in Paddy's poems that have been influenced by the East and what connections and what uniqueness does Paddy bring as a poet to that before we go on to look at synergy? Well, I think one of the things that strikes me is the reach that there is between the poetry, the place, the culture that I know uh, living here in Ireland and a culture which belongs to a country or countries that I've never visited, although I do know them through literature. And what interests me is the way in which uh, Paddy brings elements of his experience of China, his experience of Tibet and Nepal uh, into uh, work which feeds into English poetry uh, in Ireland and relates to that. So that there is something of the exotic, something of the strange, but it is the strange made familiar, as he said himself. And I think it's an unusual richness which it brings. But linked to that also is a quality which he spoke of himself, which is absence. The fact that uh, Li Bai is conscious of a need to reach out for friends. He himself in China is reaching back to Ireland. And I think that that geographical extent does take on an imaginative and visionary quality in his poetry, which I find very valuable. Visionary is a very good uh, place to start. Uh, Paddy Bush is a visionary of the real. Uh, It's that mindfulness, that attentiveness that I find so attractive in his work. And I think that comes from the East. You know, he looks at things with a clear-sighted attentiveness. Silence is brought acutely to speech, sparingly and patiently. Um, And like Levi, you know, Paddy travels with windswept clouds. He lets whoops of delight at the moon. He is wakened by the scent of flowering shrubs. You know, he has opened himself out to the elemental and the cosmic. And I think that is something that has come from the East. And I'm sure Peter and myself will be discussing in particular that wonderful poem that Peter has already mentioned, the Li Bai uh, poem. Just before we explore the poem, Kyle, Peter talked about how Paddy is able to reach through his attention to detail. You have looked at how he pays attention to the minutiae of the wonderness of what the ordinary around him and can reach the universe. I wonder, is that the synergy that Paddy brings to us as readers that in some sense he can envision, but in his poetry he's able to carry us on the journey to the cosmic by making it accessible to the reader? I think that's a very large claim to make for the poetry. Um, It is wonderful poetry, but I don't think we do any service by inflating it sort of beyond itself. Um, There is, I think, one of the remarkable things about looking at sort of Paddy's career generally is the way in which the work has developed and talking particularly about his engagement uh, with the East. One of the things that I notice is that he moves from writing... I suppose, as a traveller fascinated with what he sees. And I think particularly the poems in China, and I'm looking forward to engaging with Cahal about the the Li Bai poem in a moment. A lot of the Chinese poems are the poems of an observer. I think that it's the poems that he writes from uh, Nepal and Tibet that have real strength and that there something has been internalised to a much greater extent which informs his work. So Peter is talking about the observer and you talk about what he notices and observes in the lie by poem, Kyle. Could you take us into the poem? Well, I think uh, observation is vitally important to any poet. Good poets are seers. And all that the word seer implies, looking at things attentively and seeing them, that sort of wide awake approach to the natural world. I'm interested in the poetry that reveals the world anew in the way that all good poets 
do. And I think Paddy does it very effectively in the Chinese and in particularly in the Nepalese uh, poems. But this particular one, the Li Bai uh, poem, uh, for me, it has a sort of unassuming eloquence about it. You know, it's scrupulous attention to sound. I, I admire the lyric artistry of the poem. Here, without raising his voice, a moment becomes vivid, becomes intimate and cosmic. The other thing that I find in the poem uh, that attracts me is the journey motif. Of course, the journey motif is in all the poems, but it, it, it is here. Uh, the poem is a sort of sightseeing tour of the self. And like the Celts and let's say, the Hopi Indians, you know, the ritual journey into the unknown is important in the poem. Could you give us an example of such journey and observation that has been awakened in you from the poem? Yes, well, I just like how he place in part five, for example, place two becomes a kind of absence for the wanderer. Even after 60 years, I can still pine for the distant grasslands of my childhood, their huge perspectives along flowered valleys to the high passes, the tents, the cattle bells, the whooping herdsmen. My breath still catches on the pine-incensed road into Sichuan. I sigh day after day for fishermen poling bamboo rafts on the river at Yangshu. And my heart still scales the hundred terraces of dragons back mountain where white cranes walk in a dream entranced by their own elegance. Ah, more wine, the traveller's curse is to ache, to be everywhere, all at once. The wisdom in that as well. You know, a poet in his maturity, if he is good, achieves a sense of wisdom. And I think the traveller's curse is to ache to be everywhere, all at once. That type of wisdom uh, is something that I find is coming more and more into Paddy's poetry. Peter had talked earlier about a sense of absence, but you're saying that he found place through absence. Mm -hmm. I just wonder what occurs for you in Paddy's poems, Peter, when you hear Kyle's reflections. I'd have a slightly different take on this particular poem to begin with, Le- Le Bai's bas- last poem, um, I'd agree that it is a poem about absence. It has these lovely lines like searching the Milky Way for friends. But uh, as Petty said himself when talking about it, it's a poem which, first of all, has a very personal reference for him as he discovered. It's also a poem, however, which fits into, I suppose, a particular mode of poetry which Paddy excels in, which is not necessarily anything to do uh, with the Orient. Uh, I'm thinking of poems like um, Hopkins and Skellig Fahil or uh, his poem about Daniel O'Connell, Counselor, which are sequences which explore narratively a figure who is identified. And uh, Li Bai or Li Po, as Cahal says, whom we know from uh, the Poets of the Late Tang, a wonderful anthology from the 1960s, uh, is a figure who is has been opened up already, uh, I think, to Western culture. And in many respects, what Paddy is doing here is writing a narrative. It's a poem which, while it does have wonderful language and wonderful imagery, as we've heard in the passage that Cahal read, nonetheless seems to rely very much on tracing a course of events. In other words, its strength in part is that of telling a story. As you said, it it, it has this epic quality to it. Um, And as such, it's it's creating a world rather than delivering one to us, I think, in many respects. I I think that's a a good point, and I I would agree with that. Uh, The narrative impulse of the poem, I think, is very strong, uh, but but that journey uh, for me is uh, very evident in a lot of Paddy's poems. Mm. But it's also the journey uh, 
uh, the passage into the psyche. You know, Paddy mm. to me is shanachi, and that's mm. a, telling the stories. But he's telling the stories of the soul, and that makes me think of the Celtic tradition as well. You know, all of these imrama in the Celtic mm. uh, literature, where uh, the poet. Uh, the adventurer goes out into the unknown and experience extraordinary things, but they are of no avail until the poet, the adventurer, comes back and shares these wonders, uh, these insights back with the community. And I think that's what you know happens in good poetry. That's what the poetry is about. It is sharing, giving back to the community, go uh, uh, wh- wh- whatever has been experienced. That's actually a, a lovely idea. That idea of, of going on a journey and bringing something back. Because I think one of the things that that Paddy has done is, I think, with great tact, has managed to deliver back to us a sense of the East of China and of Tibet, in language and imagery, which has been naturalized into his own poetic lexicon. Yes. Um, I mean, the great danger of, I think, writing about the Orient is that, you know, the poems you write will almost read like translations. And you know, Paddy's work avoids that completely. He comes back and these are poems which belong with us, even if they are about the high Himalayas, even if they are about Kathmandu. And for you, Peter, what is it that triggers that sense of belonging? Well, I suppose I could instance one remarkable poem just to pick up on something uh, that um, Paddy said when you asked him if he was in any sense sort of political and he denied it. But there is one very politically outspoken poem in there, which is uh, Ritual for the Propitiation of the Abnormal Dead, um, where he begins you might say in observer traveler mode saying that yes there's this um culture in i think it's naxi or the dongba have a ritual uh, to i suppose appease the spirits of the abnormal dead i mean people who died of unnatural or unexplained causes and then having described that very abruptly and very strikingly goes on to talk about the need to propitiate and appease the abnormal dead in Ireland, whether it's in Grey Steel or Bailna or in Smerrick, citing a whole litany and list of either atrocities or massacres or deaths in Ireland. And the conjunction of uh, those two aspects is very powerful and, in fact, makes a strong poetry of protest. And I'd like to leave our listeners there, let them take to the air with the discussion that we've had tonight, where we've been brought to, and explore for themselves the wonder of Paddy Bush's poetry. Peter Denman and Carla Sharkey, thank you so much. This programme has been kindly funded through the Sound and Vision Scheme, which is a funding scheme from the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. Of Ireland. Of Ireland. Of Ireland. Of Ireland.